الحمد لمن هداني لسنة العدنان محمد المختار وسيد الأطهار السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So this is my wife and she's actually a revert ما شاء الله And there's a question There's a question From Japan uh, I was born and raised in Chicago Chicago, yeah. originally Japanese Japanese That's yeah, yeah. cool, ما شاء الله You know, I kept my shahad I think see your videos too الحمد لله الحمد لله yeah. She watched the videos and that's how you learn about Islam I, I I actually watched the video <laughs> and she actually throwing me lots of questions and uh, I came up with your videos and everything and I yeah because because as a Muslim I was born and raised in Muslim right and uh, I understand but I don't have the the understanding to explain. So, so your yeah, videos yeah. is actually helping me. And second thing, in, English is not my, my language. That's uh, right, 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 English right, right. my second yeah. language. So and it's really beautiful when I see brothers and sisters like yourself who, I mean, especially yourself who became Muslim by watching the OMF videos because, you know, we yeah, come yeah. out here and sometimes we just do a lot of debates and things and it's stressful. But when I see this, this is like the results of the da'wah, people from other parts of the world that watch the video and become Muslim from it. And yeah. it also encourages other people who share the videos, yeah, yeah. who post the videos because it spreads the da'wah. Yeah. So, Jazakallah khair for coming all the way yeah. out here. Yeah. And it made me really happy yeah. to yeah. see this. Yeah. I did my shahada in March this year. In March. Mashallah. Allah make you firm in the deen, give you istiqama and bless you and make you a means of hidayah for all of Japan and Chicago. <laughs> okay. uh, so you, you have, uh, there's a few questions <laughs> from my wife. I mean, uh, if you can put the mic to her. And, uh, I mean, it's nothing crazy. Yeah. It's okay. It's a simple question. Simple question, sometimes are the most beneficial. Oh. So, like, why pray if everything is written? Excellent. Like that's, that's not a simple question. That's a beautiful question. So, oh. why do we pray in good deeds and do good deeds if everything is written? So, when we talk about Qadr, and that's the concept of predestination, most people don't understand this concept. And I'll, I'll give you a simple answer. I mean, we have whole lessons on it. But... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is the greatest. His knowledge is so great that He knows what will happen before it happens. But it doesn't mean that He forces you to do it. Right? So it's not like we're robots and whatever we're programmed with to pray or not pray, we're just carrying out a program. That's not the way it is, right? Imagine like this. Like, let's say you went into the future. Right? Let's say, I mean, as humans, our, our knowledge is limited. But I'm going to give an example, right? You went into the future and you saw, what was your name again? Abdul Karim. Ahmed. Ahmed, mashallah. You saw Ahmed uh, driving a Rolls Royce, right? For example, right? Now, you come back, you've seen the future, so you know he's going to buy a Rolls Royce. But does that mean you forced him to buy it? No. You didn't, right? So even if you wrote down, hey, I saw the future, Ahmed's buying a Rolls Royce, or sure, I've seen it, right? But he's going to make that decision. Right? So Allah knows what would happen, that is from the greatness of Allah. He has written everything down because He knows, but He doesn't force it upon us, right? So each one of us has a choice. In some things we have no choice, right? For example, is it going to be sunny or rainy today? We have no choice, right? San Diego, it's going to be sunny, right? But Chicago, I don't know, right? Um, but we are not held accountable for that. If it rains or if it's sunny, we will not go to Jannah, heaven, or Jahannam, hellfire. We will not be held accountable to the Day of Judgment. What color eyes you have, what color hair you have, what color skin you have, none of that benefits you or harms you. That is that is not our choice, right? Allah wrote it, it will be. But certain things that are choices. Like you could have this weekend coming out, instead of coming all the way here and coming to the da'wah table, may Allah reward you and make your trip as a reward for you. You could have gone to Las Vegas and gambled and <laughs> drank alcohol, right? Yeah. It's America, it's free country, right? Nobody yeah, yeah. would say anything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you will be held accountable for that choice. Yeah. Right? There, Allah will then hold you accountable because you made that choice. Now from the greatness of Allah is that He knows what choices will be made. But what He is not, is He did not force those choices on us. So our responsibility is to strive and struggle, to pray and fast and give charity and be the best we can. Uh -huh. Good? Good. Okay. Uh, next question. If it's not clear, keep asking. I'm here. Oh, but oh. if not, next. Yeah, yeah. So I know, like, it's encouraged to pray tahajjud, and yes. you know, like, the prayers will be answered even more. Yes. I heard. So how is that different from normal praying and non? Excellent. So why? The more we pray, and the best times that we pray at, the more the prayers are accepted. Right? Meaning, um, I'll give you an example. Right? Let's say you go to work. Right? 
and your, your salary is $100 an hour, right? And then they tell you, hey, if you work overtime, we're going to pay you 150 right? Well, I mean, it's the same hour, same time, but because you went over and above, you get paid more, right? Or they tell you, uh, you know, if you're going to uh, fly to from here to LA, your stipend is this much. But if you fly from here to China, you're going to get an additional bonus for the international travel. Like, this is how it works in work. So now, there are things that we have to do. The five-time prayers, it's a fault, it's an obligation, we must pray. So that one, every, every Muslim, alhamdulillah, prays five times a day, right? Hopefully, right? Um, but then, those that want to be closer to Allah, those that want to do above and beyond, then they pray the sunan, the extra prayer. Then they wake up at night where everybody's asleep and everybody's snoring and they wake up and they make wudu and nobody knows and you start praying and you're making dua. At these times, you're closer to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah descends to the last sama in the, in the last part of the night and he asked, who is there to ask? I said, this is a time where your prayers are accepted because it's the time that Allah loves for the, for the slaves of Allah to be praying to him. And there are other times, like between the Adhan and Iqama. Once the Adhan happens and the Iqama, this is the time where prayers are accepted. We're going to make dua in this time. There is a time in, in the day of Jum'ah where dua is accepted. So for us, just like you know, at work, we want to figure out how can we make the best salary. We need to figure out what those times are and how we can take advantage of those times. Right? And the one who strives and struggles reach their destination. Right? Let's say you were going to drive from here to Chicago. Long drive, right? But it's not going to be easy. You're going to get tired. It's going to be. You're going to take breaks. Your car's going to have problems. You know, food issues. Can't find halal. All kinds, right? So if you if you want to be like, nah, forget it. You know, then you're not going to make it. But if you're like, no, nope, we're going to go, and then you 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 toughen through it, then you will make it to your destination. So Jannah is our destination. So the one who strives and struggles the most will make it to the highest level of Jannah. So we ask Allah to accept it from us and to give us the ability to use those times. Ah, okay. You understand? Uh, yeah, I understand. Oh. What else? Oh. Is there any question? So, in regards to like acceptance of prayer, then, but it's already written, mm -hmm. so... So again, then. what's written is what Allah's knowledge has, not what will be forced upon you, right? So you got to think like this. Um, Let's say, and I'm going to give you a very basic, simple human example, because I can't give you an example of Allah, because Allah is the greatest, Allah is above our thoughts, right? But it'll give you an understanding of the concept, right? Let's say you, you're here, we have a water fountain behind us, and you have a child, and you see the child running. Now you as a parent, as somebody who's lived life, who's seen experience, know at the rate that he's running, or she's running, she's going to slip and walk, fall in the water. And you tell the child, hey, stop, you're going to slip and fall in the water, right? And the child doesn't listen, he's going to run, he's going to slip and fall in the water, right? Now, your knowing that is because of your knowledge and your experiences and how you know at speeds and things. But it doesn't mean you force the child to fall, right? So Allah knows whose dua will be answered. That is from the greatness of Allah. But it is upon us to make dua and to ask and to beg Allah and to strive and pray for it to be accepted. If we don't do it, it's our shortcoming. We cannot complain to anybody. If we do it, Allah answers the dua for sure. Allah always answers the dua. Yeah. There are three things that happen to a dua. Either Allah knows best for you and gives it to you right there. If we're sincere, right? Let's say you make dua. I want to go to San Diego and meet Uthman at uh, OMF. Allah answered your dua, you're here. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes Allah knows it's not the best time for you. Right? Sometimes Allah knows that at that time you won't be able to handle it. Right? Somebody says, Allah, make me a billionaire. But Allah knows, even though we may not know, that if you became a billionaire, maybe you'll get misguided. Maybe yeah. you'll become mutakabir, yeah. you'll become yeah. prideful. Yeah. Right. Maybe you'll start not caring about people because you'll fall you'll for the glamour and glory. So Allah doesn't give it to you there. He waits till you are ready for it and then gives it to you. Like we have a lot of young brothers, they're like, Allah, I want to get married, right? But they got no job, they got no anything, right? So Allah knows they got married, they couldn't handle it at that time. So then Allah waits till they're ready and then Allah finds them the spouse, right? So then we wow, make that. <laughs> Good example. Good example. <laughs> right? So this is sometimes you have to be patient with your dua. And the last thing is sometimes Allah knows that it's not good for you. And Allah sees the reward in the hereafter. Dua is never wasted. 
Like let's say I make the Allah make me the Khalifa of America, right? Maybe Allah knows that in my heart that the kind of person I am, right? Maybe I will be very cruel, maybe I will not be nice. So Allah doesn't give it to me as, as a mercy to me. But even then that dua, I will get as reward in the hira. So dua is never wasted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I have actually a question. Go for it. Uh, so uh, we have prayer, right? Yeah. Uh, the five prayer, right? So five uh, Fajr, Zuhur, Asar, and everything. Uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, sallu kama ra'aytu muni usalli. Mashallah, beautiful. You know the hadith and everything. Yeah. So, uh, but what I see uh, in today's world, like we have different. Uh, type of you know uh tahir, and, yeah. you, you know even even the tahiyat tahir, tahir sure. is, is different so yeah. uh, is it is it we invented it or no so oh. so let me explain uh, oh, is it, is you guys have good questions by the way right? but i'm gonna try to give a brief answer right the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he prayed right and the sahaba radiallahu anhum the, the companion they saw him pray they memorized his prayer they wrote down now, from that, the great scholars of Islam, especially the Imams, the famous Imams, Abu yeah, yeah. Hanifa and Malik and yeah. Shafi and Ahmad, may Allah be pleased with all of them, they would derive the fiqh, right? But questions would come up that maybe wasn't in front of them, right? For example, uh, if you saw me prayer today, maybe you'll remember part of my prayer, you'll remember part of my prayer, but when you go back to Malaysia and somebody asks you, hey, uh, what did Uthman say in the last part of the dua? You'll be like, I don't know, it was a silent salah, I couldn't hear him, right? So some things you won't catch. So then the scholars did their best to put together the prayer as the Prophet ﷺ prayed, right? So not every scholar is going to be right in everything. Right? I mean, a scholar is a human being, right? He's not a prophet, right? So they tried their best. So the best thing is to pray in accordance with what is closest to the evidences, right? So for example, uh, I'm going to put Malaysia on blast here. I hope you're not going to get upset. And I hope my Malaysian viewers also don't get upset because I want to come visit soon. Oh, about, about the uh, so, so in Malaysia when I was there, one of the things I saw is after the salah, people would get up and they would make like a little circle thing and they would walk around saying, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin and they would shake hands. Shake hands, yeah, yeah. Shake hands, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this was surprising to me because I had never seen this. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I've been to many Muslim countries, I, I studied Sharia, I have a master's in Hadith, I never saw this anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And when I asked the brothers, they were like, eh, this is our tradition, right? They, it oh, yeah, yeah. became like a sunnah, uh -huh. even though it's not in Hadith. Uh -huh. So the way we know is we say, okay, brothers, is this in Hadith? Did the Prophet do it this way or not, right? And when the answer comes out, there is no evidence for it, or the evidence is weak hadith, uh -huh. then we leave it. Doesn't matter which Imam took it, doesn't matter if my culture took it. Our loyalty is to call Allah what Allah says, and call a Rasul what uh, the Prophet said. What is authentic, that is what we accept. Right? So with that, it becomes clear. Right? So now, like in the Majd Ribad channel, so we have the One Message Foundation, we have Majd Ribad. We have entire lessons that take you through the fiqh with evidence. Like, okay, this is how you make wudu, and here is the proof from the Quran, from the authentic hadith. This is how you pray, here is the proof. So when you follow those evidences, you're praying according to the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the Prophet said, Sallu kama That's it. Oh, oh very good. Okay. Good? Yeah. <laughs> okay, wow. Is there a question? Hmm? Oh, I, I don't Wait, I don't know if I'm, I don't know where I got this information, but is it okay to pray after praying? Like making dua after you pray? To make dua after your prayer is good, right? When you finish your prayer, to make dua is something good. But some masjid, what they do is they make a congregational dua. Like after the prayer, the imam will turn around and everybody will raise their hand and they'll make it in jama'ah. We don't know this to be a regular sunnah. Like people who do it all the time, like after every prayer, they make a congregational dua. This becomes a bid'ah. This becomes an innovation. Because we know the Prophet ﷺ used to make his azkar. And, and if you do make, make an individual dua. Right? So meaning, if you, if you just made your salah in the park, and then you wanted to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, bless you with knowledge. Great. After your prayer, this is a good time to make dua. 
But sometimes in the masajid, they take it to an extreme, where every prayer you have to have a congregational du'a. Like I've been to masajid where I led the prayer, and afterwards when I didn't do it, they like got upset, you know? <laughs> but this is not something that you make a congregational prayer is not sunnah, mm -hmm. but you make your own du'a is sunnah. Oh, I see. Oh, should I ask about you got anything else? Facebook or picture? Oh, yeah, yeah. Continue. Oh, so you know, like I just reverted. Alhamdulillah. Allah bless you and reward oh, you for it. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. But, um, you know, like Facebook, my pictures before I became Muslim are still up there. And. You can slowly, slowly start taking them off. Uh, uh, no, it's yeah. actually it's people, from. Yeah, people. like I'm tagged in them, but it's uh, on other people's Facebook. So if you are not in control of them, then you're not responsible for them, right? Uh, because it's not under your control. But if if they're like on your Facebook or your family, you can humbly request them. That, you know, now I, I cover, I'm requesting you if you can take those pictures down. Uh, but again, anything from the past, you are not liable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, you are, you when you became Muslim, you're like a newborn baby. Everything is cleaned yeah. out. It's a great mercy from Allah. When Allah guides somebody to Islam, uh, I mean, there's something so beautiful because even any bad deeds you may have had get turns into good deeds. Lots of reward for you, right? Yeah. So you're you're wonderful. But oh. now going forward is what you're responsible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess I remember you said that. Too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I said. That. Yeah, mashallah. But, oh, okay. But I'm, I'm jealous of her. Oh. <laughs> May Allah give you the reward because you were also the means of giving her the Islam. So inshallah, inshallah. Will be in your, her good deeds will be in your reward. So inshallah. you just work. Together and keep building a pious household with pious yeah, children Allah. and a Allah. pious Allah. community. Yeah. And make sure, don't forget the aspect of da'wah to your family, mm -hmm. to your old friends, to people, especially in Japan, because that's a place where Islam isn't as well known or well understood as other countries. Mm -hmm. And it's growing, alhamdulillah. And we get some emails and stuff from Japan, but uh, but inshallah, it will be great because you're from Japan, you know the language, I'm assuming, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the culture. So for you, it will be much easier to do the da'wah to them than somebody from like myself or somebody from outside. Mm -hmm. so. okay. Inshallah, slowly, slowly. Uh, inshallah. Oh, okay. Anything there? Mm -hmm. about, about the uh, 5,000 years ago, the human is still oh, alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But still going with the Facebook pictures, but I still feel sad. Like It's okay. And, I mean, like I said, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful and so forgiving and so loving that He knows your intention, right? So let's say somebody uh, has a picture of you from a long time ago and Allah knows in your heart you don't want it there but you have no ability to take it off, Allah will not hold you accountable for it. That's the beauty of Islam. Allah does not hold you accountable for anybody else's sins. Mm. Unlike the Christian idea, you're born with sin because yeah, yeah. of Adam. Like, yeah. we don't believe that. Why? Because yeah. every child is born pure. And when you become a Muslim, you're like a child. You're pure. You're everything cleaned out. I mean, I'm glad that you have that love for hijab and that love for doing things right. And you should always keep that. But don't let it make you depressed or sad because your, your Rabb, Allah, is so merciful and so loving that He doesn't hold you accountable for what's outside your power. Mm. If you're good. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Wait, I do have more questions. Go ahead. So if Allah is so merciful, then why in the Quran, you know, He says disbelievers are going to go to hell. Sure. And also, what was it? It was the fourth to last surah? Uh-huh. The uncle? Oh, the... Uh, Al Lahab. Uh, Abu Lahab. Ab Abu yeah. Lahab, yeah. Excellent. I what? thought you say like you won't know anyone's heart until the very last minute of their sure. death. Like they might even change... I will explain. So, Allah is so merciful and so loving that He gives us the ability to choose right from wrong. And He gives us guides, like the prophets, and He gives us signs in our daily life. And Allah gives us so many openings for us to leave that what's wrong and go toward what's right, right? But Allah doesn't force it on. Right? Just like He doesn't force us to go to Jahannam, He doesn't force us to go to Jannah. It has to be a choice. Just like a professor, right? I mean, if, as a human example. Again, the examples of Allah are too high. We give basic examples to understand concepts. A professor puts up a test, right? And he wants, a good professor at least, wants you to pass. Allah invites you in the Quran to Dar Salaam, the place of peace, Al Jannah. He wants you to get to Jannah. That's what He wants for you. So Allah sends us all kinds of choices and abilities and signs for us to know right from wrong. Right? If seeing all of that and we ignore all of that, 
and we worship other than Allah, knowing in our hearts, in our fitrah, that nothing can benefit except Allah, right? Then we choose a path that takes us to the hellfire. Just like the student who knows the test is coming, the teacher helps him, tells him, hey, do your homework, here's a study guide, this is the time of the test, and the student's like, eh, not gonna care, right? And then that student that goes through that test, in the end, if he doesn't make it or she doesn't make it, and they fail, it's not the professor's fault, right? The teacher has to pass and fail according to your results, right? So Allah gave Abu Lahab so many chances. Right? Abu Lahab had the opportunity. He was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. He was the neighbor of the Prophet ﷺ. He saw miracles with his own eyes. He saw the moon split. He saw so many beautiful things that he knew, but out of his arrogance and his pride and his hatred for the truth, he not only didn't become a Muslim, but he had his sons divorce the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. Like what did they have to do with it, right? To, to be cruel. His wife, Um Jamil Urwa, she would take filthy things and throw it into the house of the Prophet because they were neighbors. And on the way, when he would walk, and they would go out of the way, he would walk behind the Prophet cursing the Prophet stopping people from listening to him. Eh? At a time when people were wanting to listen, like when the Prophet went to the mountain and he called the people and told them, if I told the army behind the mountain, would you believe me? And they were like, yes. And he told them, look, I know there's an akhirah coming. When he was, Abu Jahl was one that stopped the people. He would tell them, don't listen to this man. And he would curse, he would say, Tabba like, may slow destruction be upon you. So because of those actions, he deemed himself in the hellfire, right? And Allah knows the future. So Allah saw that and he revealed the Quran, right? And this is a proof of the truthfulness of the Quran. Because Abu Lahab, he heard this surah. He could have faked become a Muslim just to try to prove the Quran wrong, but he didn't, right? Because what Allah saw from his actions had sealed his future. Right? If people choose not to obey the greatest commandment, which is don't worship other than Allah. Even in the Bible, the first commandment, here Israel, your Lord is one. Second commandment, don't worship idols and images. Even in the Bible, but look at Christians today, they go and worship idols. You go to a Catholic church, you see saints and Mary and this. You go to a Christian church, you see Jesus hanging on the idols, images, which is forbidden in the Bible. Jesus in the Bible, he prayed by putting his forehead on the ground. It's in the Bible, yeah, yeah. right? But which Christian do you see doing that today? I've been to many churches, they're out there doing this, or dancing, or you know, doing hallelujah, and all this stuff. But you don't see them praying like the Muslims pray, putting their forehead to the ground. In their own Bible, even after all the additions and corruptions and additions, even then they have Ibrahim, Musa, others praying with their forehead to the ground. You as a Muslim, you as a Muslim, you pray the way Jesus prayed. You pray the way Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed. How Musa and Ibrahim alayhim wassalam, Allah peace and blessing with all the prophets, they prayed, right? But somebody who knows all that, they see the corruptions, but they're like, nope, I don't care what's the truth. I'm gonna stick to worshiping a, a white guy on a cross, or uh, you know, like for example, in Japan, you have a lot of Shintoism, right? You're worshiping your ancestors. What are the answers? What do they know? They're dead. They're gone, right? You go to you go to uh, India. You see, I saw myself. People taking cow urine, like a cow is urinating, and they run and they're splashing it on themselves. Disgusting, right? Like, what are you doing? They're worshiping a cow. Like a cow, you make burgers out of that thing. Come on, you know that's not God. And they know it's the truth, but they're stubborn on it. Like in India right now, there's many Muslims being killed just for being Muslim. Oh, yeah. By Hindu extremists and stuff, they're going out, chopping people up and things. And why? Just out of this hatred for the truth, right? How many prophets were killed for what? Yeah, yeah. Just for believing in Allah. Right? So when you do that, then you set your own path. Right? Allah doesn't want that for you. Allah wants guidance for you. That's why Allah gave you fitrah, that natural knowing that there is one great creator. Then Allah gave you signs. And Allah could have not given us any of that. But look at the mercy of Allah. Look at the sky. Look at plants. Look at animals. Look at humans. Look at the human body and how it functions. All of those beautiful signs that Allah gave us. Right? As a guidance. And then on top of that, Allah sent prophets, one after the other, from Adam to Muhammad, alayhi wasalam, a peace and blessing upon all of them, right? All of them as guides. Then Allah sent scriptures. We would change them as humanity, would change them. Allah sent the final scripture, preserved it. With all of this, if you still don't go towards Islam, then what can Allah, Allah can't force you, right? Allah can only show you the way and call you towards it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Okay. So don't be sad <laughs> about the pictures. Okay. I don't okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Anything? Mm, yeah, I have a question. Why did he even just create humans to begin with? Why? Was he bored? Was he... So Allah creates what he wants, why he wants, right? We don't really have the ability to say why, right? Because Allah is the great creator. Allah doesn't need humans. Allah has always been there. So there's been an infinite amount of time that we can't even imagine that there were no humans, right? And Allah will always be there. But Allah chose to create many creations, not just humans, right? Allah created jinn, Allah created humans, Allah created animals, Allah created uh, things that we can't see, things that may be above the skies, like angels and other creations of Allah. And Allah created it with His wisdom. Right? What is the purpose of our creation? That's what we can ask. Right? What, what should we be doing? Allah SWT says, ما خلقت الجن والإنسة إلا ليعبدون. I did not create the jinn or, in, or in, the jinns or humans except to worship them. Worshipping Allah means first and, uh, first and foremost recognizing. To know who is Allah. Right? The first thing, we need to recognize who is Allah. Right? And then, as you have done, accept, that, accept the truth of Islam and then live our life according to the Sharia. That's worship. Not just the prayer. The prayer is only one aspect. Right? When it's Ramadan fasting, that's ibadah. When you, it's time to give zakat, that's ibadah. When you see a poor person, you help them, that's ibadah. When you see a person oppressed and you help them, that's ibadah. That's all part of worshipping Allah, right? That's what Allah created it for us. That's our purpose in life. Good? Okay. But how do you know it's the truth? Like to me, okay, I believe it's the truth, and I, maybe he, you know, he would think it's the truth. But how did, how can we say it's the universal Excellent. truth? A great for question. How everyone do we know, as uh, best science is true. Yeah, I got you. Um, when we look at the first thing, we have to look at is there a creator or not, right? That's the first question, right? And if we look at how the human body works, how it functions, how the environment works, how perfectly balanced. Humans take in oxygen, put out carbon dioxide. Plants take in carbon dioxide, put out oxygen. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Right? In this perfect balance, we know no doubt there is a creator. Right? Very simple, I'm sure you've seen the videos I asked this question. If I ask somebody that this phone, Apple, Samsung, nobody made it. By itself, over trillions of years, trillions of years, pieces of sand made it exactly the way it is. Screen protector, camera, the cover, Siri, unlocking, all of those functions, nobody programmed it, right? Any logical human being will say that's not true. That just can't be. It's too perfect, that the interaction is such that it had to be programmed by somebody, right? If that's true, the human body is more complicated than this phone. Your eyes are greater, better designed than this camera. Your brain is much better than Siri, right? Mm. Your brain doesn't tell you signal lost, you know, yeah. can't answer, right? <laughs> you, you have more functionalities than a phone, right? The design of the human... If I, if I drop this phone and it cracks, it's not going to heal itself. But you get cut, your body heals itself, even without you thinking about it. And like you don't think, heal, heal, <laughs> heal, right? Your heart is beating, are you thinking? Like, beat, beat, beat. Imagine if you had to. You'd be all dead, we'd all be dead because you go to sleep, a lot, right? right? But your heart beats when you eat and drink, it's the same pathway, but there's a little silly piece of flesh that yeah. goes one yeah. way or the yeah. other. Yeah. You don't even think about it. Sometimes it goes the wrong way to make you recognize that there is such a function going on. You have kidneys and livers and so do I, right? I mean, all these skin cells and white blood cells. And we don't, who designed all that? So the first thing we have to do, there is a creator. If there is a creator, that creator is not going to leave us without guidance, right? Think about it. Mm -hmm. If you design a, a new car, it's not a Toyota, it's not a Honda, it's not a Benz, it's not a Porsche, it's not a Tesla, it's something amazing. It flies in the air and goes in the water and it has a technology that nobody's ever seen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you design, we're going to make a second jama'ah, we pray two jama'ah, one jama'ah prays and the other comes in. So, when you design such a car, and you are the one who manufactured it, designed it, developed it, there will be things to, like what kind of gasoline will it take, will it take diesel, will it take gasoline, will it take electricity, you know it, 
you're not just gonna take it and be like, huh, guys, do what you want with it. You're gonna be, let me explain to you, when you buy a Tesla, they don't just give it to you. They explain to you how it works and they have manuals and user manuals and CDs and websites and training, right? So with all of that, the manufacturer, the designer who's intelligent, makes sure that their creation is used correctly, right? So Allah, as our creator, he's not gonna just leave us without guidance, right? So we believe there is a creator, no doubt. I mean, the, the, the entire universe is an is a evidence for that, right? And then we believe that that creator is more intelligent than us, he designed us. So that creator is not gonna leave us without guidance, just like we wouldn't, right? But our creator is greater than us and more knowledgeable than us. So then he sends us guidance. So then we have to say, okay, what is the truth between the different religions, right? Now, if you think about it, and I'm gonna give a very simple answer, not that much time. You look at the Hindu faith, right? You look at uh, worshiping of monkeys, and uh, I mean, like for example, I don't know if you've read, I've studied some Hinduism, and they have the story of Ram and Gita, right? Ram is the main creator, God, guy, real powerful, all that, right? And then he has a wife named Sita, and then he, she's also a goddess, right? And then Ram goes out of the house, and I'm summarizing the story, and this guy named Ravan, who is this evil king from Sri Lanka, I don't know why Sri Lanka, with like 12 heads. <laughs> I don't know how he has 12 heads, right? <laughs> he comes and he tempts her out and kidnaps her and takes her. And for more than a year, he's having his way with her. And a god can't rescue his wife. Come on. <laughs> like what god? If somebody tried to kidnap your wife, you would like give your life, but you would protect her. As a Muslim man, I mean, nobody's touching my wife. I'm, I'll give my life, whatever, I'll, but I'm not going to let anybody dishonor me like that, right? A god can't protect his wife. He has to get help from a monkey god, named Hanuman, mm. to storm. Come on, right? Like, these are stories. These are fables. This is not. They know it's not the truth. They know there's not a twelve-headed guy walking around Sri Lanka and all that kind of stuff, right? They have this elephant head guy because the god got jealous of his wife's creation from her her her, her dirt, and he cut off his head and put an elephant head. He put an elephant head on a human body. Come on, right? Like. All of that stuff, you know that's not mm -hmm. These are traditions that developed over time. If you look at ancestor worship, if you look at Buddhism, if you look at Shintoism, these are philosophies. These are not talking about the ultimate truth about the creator of the universe and so on. People have made them into religions, right? So you, that's all nonsense, right? Then you get to the Abrahamic faith. Okay, you have the Old Testament. Today, any Jewish scholar will tell you that you, if the writings that were with Moses, according to them, were there, we don't have them today. The fall of Babylon, the, the, the displacement of the people of Israel, from different stories, from songs, they rewrote a lot of that, right? That means the original is lost. Right? If you look at the traditions of the Judaic faith today, hardly any of them can be traced back to Musa salam, or Dawud salam, right? Mm -hmm. I was in Israel, in Palestine, may Allah free it. Uh, and there, we saw the Orthodox Jews walking around with like curls and the hats and the big furry hats and the big robes and I was like, that's a pretty weird dress for like a hot area like that, right? So I asked them like, is this from like Musa alayhi salam, did he dress like that? Is that why you all, and he goes, no, no, this was developed in different places in, in Europe and there was a king of Europe that made people wear the tails of foxes and then that became that fur. Like what? No, no, that is from Musa alayhi salam. I saw, I saw it, you can Google it, but I saw it myself. They would take live chickens, Jews, and they would throw it over their head, hmm. like a live chicken, right? Mm -hmm. Where is that from? Is it in the Torah, is it in the Talmud? Is it from Musa alayhi salam, Dawud alayhi salam? No. Hmm. So all that is just made up, right? So you know that's not the truth, right? Then you get to Christianity, and you look at the Bible, and you look at the contradictions in the Bible, and you, mm -hmm. you've seen the video, so you know, mm -hmm. and you look at the additions yeah. and subtractions and the different versions of the Bible, mm -hmm. and you know that's not. That's not the message of Isa ibn Mari, right? Whoever wrote it from the Greek author, they may have aspects of that message still. They may have taken some aspects, mm -hmm. but no doubt, much of it, is, even if you look at the King James Version and the New uh, Revised Version, and NIV and New International Version, and you look at uh, the NSAV and you look at the Jehovah's Witness, all of them have even different numbers of verses. There are verses that are taken out, right? So that tells you that these were fabrications. The Catholic Bible has a whole different number of chapters. So all of this has been added and subtracted. So that brings you to the final message of Allah, of the Creator, the Quran. The one that is preserved letter by letter, word by word, without any doubt, right? Even how we pronounce it, we have to attribute back to the Prophet 
Subhanallah. And if people talk about the Hafz Quran and the Qalun Quran, because they don't understand what that is. That is a recitation. And even that has to be with a chain mutawatir in a multiple chains back to the Prophet in accordance to only one Quran that is a Musaf Uthman in accordance to the Arabic grammar. Right? So even how we pronounce it we preserve, let alone the wordings and Tajweed. letters and so on. Right? Tajweed, Makharij, Qur'at, which came from the Ahruf and so on. So that is the final preserved message. No doubt that we can, we have carbon dated manuscripts we can look at. We can look at Kafad, like Malaysia you go, you see all these Kafad. Pakistan, Egypt, you see all these people that have memorized the whole Quran. In San Diego, we have brothers here right now in the spring. He's memorized the whole Quran. Right? Mm -hmm. Word by word, letter by letter. You can test them if you like. We do it all the time for fun. You know? it's kind of read from this surah, this ayah. So that tells you this is the final preserved truth. And that's how we know it to be the truth. Wow, yeah, okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Oh, Alhamdulillah. Okay. Um, so my dad is, I guess, atheist? Okay. Yeah. And he's so stubborn, you know, like he doesn't want religion at all, especially Japanese people because yeah. there's such a bad, I don't know, like reputation yeah. for religion right. in general. So what would you want, like if you have one thing to say to someone? I mean, uh, for your anything? father, first and foremost, I mean, show Islam in your life. Mm -hmm. Right? Be a good daughter, be, show him how Islam has benefited you, how it's improved you, how uh, you know, and, and many people that are here, their parents became Muslim from seeing a good change in their children after they became Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Secondly, because it's your father, somebody close to you, you know his mindset, right? Being stubborn, all that, but in his heart, when, when a hardship comes, when something goes, I'm sure he prays. Every human does, right? That's why they say there's no atheist on a, on a plane that's faltering, you know? Mm. When the plane starts mm. to shake, mm. nobody goes, oh, oh God, oh God. Like, I thought you didn't believe in God. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> so ask him. I mean, ask him these questions that, okay, if you don't believe there's a God, I mean, out of with love and respect and good manners, so then where do you think we came from? You know, ask him about the minimum gene concept, you know, where the, the human cell or any living matter, the cells of a human, even a single cell, parasite, bacteria types, cannot survive without a minimum set of genes, right? So if we just evolved from nothing, who set that minimum set to be there for the first cell to even survive, right? We could not have without it, right? Ask him, why do we have certain functions? How are you doing? Feel free. This is a great intro book. You wanna check that out? It's all free. All free? Yeah, all free, bro. Go for it. Go for it. Take it. The only price is you gotta read it. <laughs> Any questions you got? Ask the brother. So, if you if you look at that concept, then you explain it to your father and let him think about it. Right? Let him think about what's the purpose of life under atheism. What's moral? What's right and wrong? If you're atheist, how can how can you say something is right or wrong? Because then it's your subjective decision, right? Have these slow, and I know the answers he will give you. Watch the videos, we've already answered them to a lot of atheists, so you can learn from the videos how to answer, and keep going, inshallah, and Allah will guide you farther. Inshallah. Oh, okay. We make dua for him too. Oh, thank you. We pray every day. Inshallah, excellent, excellent. Oh, okay. Anything else? Is there anything you can say to my dad, if you can? I don't know, I'm so curious. <laughs> so, Personally, on a personal level, what personal can you level? say to someone? Uh, we'll, we'll talk afterwards. Oh, okay. We'll, talk, we'll try to see if we can maybe, where is he, is he in Chicago? Yeah. Right. I'll be coming to Chicago one of these days. Maybe we'll go and see him. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you don't have to. Oh, it's no, if you're busy, I mean, you know. We're, we're, we're traveling to different cities anyway. Uh, wow. Alhamdulillah, was yeah, just yeah, yeah. in Portland, to Mexico. Dallas. And oh. So uh, Chicago's on the list. Oh. We have a lot of brothers inviting us from out there. So if you're in Chicago, inshallah, reach out to us. Uh, we'll be coming. When I do, inshallah, maybe we'll go see him. We'll kind of sit with him on a one-on-one -on -one level and oh. have some great Japanese green tea. <laughs> okay, yes. I love green tea. I will prepare that. Yes, yeah. we do have some. Excellent. Home. I love it. <laughs> <laughs>
كل الخلائق حاضرة كل السرائر 